to the Lakeside Heritage Society Lecture Series. Uh, we are delighted to have uh, you with us today, and we're especially delighted to have our guest speaker, Ted Dress, who uh, comes from Marblehead. I'll talk a little bit more about Ted in a moment, but if you were not here last week or have not picked up the Lakeside Heritage Society schedule of activities for the summer, please pick one up at either um, table uh, by the main doors. Uh, it provides information about the um, hours of our museum and our archives. Our new director, Dakota Harkins, is to be here at the end of um, the hour, and I will introduce her. Um, most important, it gives the schedule of every Sunday at 1.30 what our presentation will be in this room. So from my perspective, that's the most important information <laughs> in this little brochure. But it also gives you the schedule of our Friday tours. Friday tours a different place um, in the historic lakeside area. Um, you need to reserve your spot by Thursday, paying $5 at the museum. And this coming Friday at 10.30, I will be doing the tour, and it is of uh, Hoover Auditorium. We'll go back to what was first there in 1873, the very first summer, and uh, bring it up to today. You'll get a chance to go backstage and upstairs, and then we'll finish up at South Auditorium. Um, next Sunday's lecture is also me. Um, this, I try to do no more than speaking twice in a week, so those are my two for this coming week. Is Friday and next Sunday. Next Sunday um, is July 2nd. I know there will be a small crowd because of all the things going on uh, as part of the July 4th weekend, and I never feel comfortable inviting a guest speaker to come when I know there won't be very many people here. So it's okay for me to do the work and have only a few people. That's okay. I don't mind that. But it's going to be fun. I have had more fun doing this presentation probably than any I've done in the last 10 years. That's because I'm hearing stories about how people named their cottages. So, next Sunday, 1.30, it's going to be What's in a Cottage Name? And I'm going to cover about 70 cottages. Um, I have a classification system that I've come up with. Um, as a scientist, I thought it was appropriate that we look at a classification system. So it's just going to be a fun afternoon. You'll, you'll laugh. And it's lighthearted. You, if you learn one or two things about cottage names, it will be a successful afternoon. Today we have with us uh, a resident of Marblehead who has been here with his family for a long, long time. And Ted is actually third generation quarry worker at the Marblehead Quarry. And you're going to learn about how that quarry operated even before his grandfather uh, worked there, through his grandfather, his father, and what he now is capable of doing given the technology that controls what happens in that great big pit across the street from Lakeside. So please welcome to the podium, Ted Dress. Before I start, I'd like to thank the question. You're kind of an experiment today. I usually give a bus tour. And, but this is the first time I've ever done a PowerPoint presentation. So this is going to be new to me. Gretchen put all of this together. Everything on the slides, she took the old archive, did all this stuff, put all this together. I've also, when I get the bus tour, I kind of you know, glimpse a little bit into the past history, but I've never had the, what you have available to you today to look at and all this stuff. So, yes. Hello, my name is Ted Gress. I am a foreman out here at the park. I have been here for 40 years. I think I pushed that. Okay. Okay, as long as it's on. I'm on. Okay. I've been About here for 40 years. 40 years and maybe I've been 10 here for days. 40 years and 25 days. I'm <laughs> <laughs> so I've been celebrating my 40 years. My father worked here for 43 years. My grandfather worked here for 56 years. Wow. With all that, I have a little bit of history behind me. When I first started, I was in quality control. We were down in the office, and I got with the older ladies down there occasionally. They would. They would pull out the old pictures and it required me to help them sort through all the old photographs and stuff like that. And I would look at this stuff and just be amazed by 
some of these old pictures and stuff. So yeah, I gained a lot of history from that. So yes, I know a little bit about it. I know what we're doing now. And so yes, I have a little bit of knowledge of the court. So the reason I got to be the tour guide of the court was about 25 years ago, the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce started this, and they approached Dave Nelson at the time and said, we would like to take bus tours to the court. And he kind of made out this big page of technical information, and down at the bottom of it, he said, he volunteer, Ted. <laughs> I've been here ever since. So, so as you can see, it's, uh, and so Columbus Limestone. So what are we quarrying over here? You actually have your Columbus Limestone. It is created a long time ago. It was laid down in those early layers 400 million years ago, and those small shallow seas back in the old days. It was just sediment and uh, small life filtering to the bottom over accumulated millions of years. You built up layers of limestone. Layers of limestone are pretty much everywhere through the world. We have a very large one out here. Uh, right now we have a layer of limestone out here. Originally it was the top layer about 20 feet and now we are pouring down another 57 feet and below that is another one. A little bit lower blade, grade, but it is still limestone all the way down through this, and all that is just sediment way down through those old layers. And the very top layers right now, you have fossils, but those have pretty much been coiled away. And the layers we're coiling right now, you have a lot of uh, just quartz and stuff, and big crystals and things like that. We really don't have a lot of fossil life in where we're coiling right now. The upper layers is where they find a lot of fossils. All the quarry areas. So all those names that you hear lately. So this is a list of names. So quarrying began back in the model of quarry back in the 1850s. Uh, it continued on through that until like the 1900s, and that's when Kelly's Line and Line and Transport Company bought the whole place up. But eventually there was like 10 small quarries scattered throughout the entire peninsula. These are some of the names. You also have uh, Dempsey's and Missouri's. It's all those names that you're familiar with, you've heard. Those were the original quarry names of people who were here long ago. This is one of the original docks. You can see it was just kind of a hand operation. They would haul the stuff down, kind of cart it down there, load it on flat bottom barges. Uh, back in those days, a lot of that went out for uh, the top layers were very layered, it was very flat stone, and a lot of that went into building stone. It was like in Fremont and Sandusky and uh, Vermilion and places like that. They would load it on stuff like that. The height top layer was very layered. It was also high in calcium, which made it very desirable for um, agricultural lime, but also for use as a flux stone in the steel mills. That was a real big market for it. That really didn't happen until the lakeside eventually brought the, the railroad to the peninsula. And then once the railroad was here, it opened up that market to take it into flux stone, into the steel mills. Before that, it was pretty much a hand operation. Kelly's Island Lime and Transport Company, they had a quarry over on Kelly's Island, and eventually when that lakeside brought the, the railroad into the peninsula, it opened up that market, and they began a major quarrying operation here. So like I said, I'm experimenting. This is, I'm reading more. Um, in the late 1890s, once the railroad came, the Kelly's Island Lime and Transport Company purchased 2,500 acres of land throughout the center of the peninsula. They began a major quarrying operation here. At one point in time, they had nearly 1,100 people working out here in this quarry. It was such a very large operation, but also a hand intensive labor operation that required that many people. They operated the small narrow gauge shade cars. Uh, you have, in later pictures, you will see large railroad cars that you usually see. But they also had these small little shade cars, they were called, the narrow gauge track. And that's what transported most of the stone right, from the quarry back into the, the plants that they had at that time. You can see this is a picture of 1890s quarries and orchards. You can see the quarry now being used going on there. The building behind is a uh, one of the process factories. But the check mark up there on top is where the orchards were. Originally, the quarry, the peninsula had a lot more orchards and stuff on it than are there right now. And it was all quarried away. But back in that day, you had a lot more orchards and things going on. If you look at that gauge track going down through there, the lower part of the picture, they used to have rail gangs, as they were called. They would quarry, they would blast the stone down, 
and then the rail gangs would come and move the tracks by hand back, lay the railroad, lay the ties, lay the tracks, bring everything back, put it back in place. It was like gangs of people. That's why you had 1,100 people working, because it required a hand crew to move those tracks back into place. So the shovel that's down there in the front could actually move right up to the wall that was blasted. This is the 1903 dual engine house. And you see, there's one big crane right there in front. On the other side, there are some of the small shade cars. So the bigger doors were meant for the larger trains. Those were used to transport stuff out to the dock. They were what was used to transport stuff out to the main line to get it out of here. On the other side is the small shade cars, and that was what was used to transport. They would haul people out to the coin operation, and they would bring stone back in, stone from the crusher, the original crusher out there, back into the process plant to the quarry. And so they had a whole line of cars across there. There's another picture that's just amazing in this. On the other side of that, the back side of that would be the machine shop. The machine shop, when I first started there, it was still kind of an operation. It was one of those, if you ever walk into a, like an old, uh, 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 an old, an old mill, and you've seen, they've got the big wheels up on top with the big belts that run stuff that go up there. This is how that was, machine shop was set up. They had all the belts up there. They had uh, some lays, metal lays in there, which were like 30 feet long, but they would make all the parts they needed for the trains. It was all, so the train broke, they would fix it right back then. They had all the stuff available. To, they would do everything that they needed back in that day. So this is a better picture of the shade cars. All, that, all those small cars right there are all the small little shade cars. You can see how many of those they have. There's another picture that's available out in the office where it shows on the other side of this all the big cars parked up there with all the entire crews of people standing all this. So my grandfather ran one of those shade cars. A story my dad tells me a lot was that it was required, they would go out there on Sunday to the, uh, an old roundhouse kind of out in the middle of the court. And my dad and his, his dad would go out there. It was easier to keep the trains fired on the weekends, on Sunday, when they were down. It was easier to keep the boilers going. So he would go out there with Grandpa and they would you know, stoke up the boiler and just keep it running rather than come in you know, Monday morning and start to fire it again. It was easier to just go out there to keep the fire going. My dad would do that with Grandpa. This is probably the most amazing picture I've ever seen. If you look, so this is like the back side of the roundhouse. So the front picture you just saw with all the cars parked in front of it. If you go down there now and you drive across where the conveyor belt comes across the road, the engine house right there with all the doors on, that's where the trains were parked. It's kind of just off the highway. This factory, so where the galleys are out there right now, where all the stack of galleys are with the stone piles underneath them, this entire factory city was built all behind there. I just, I mean, it's, I just find that amazing. And, you know, it, for all the stuff that was going on, so you have the, the tracks came in, you have a, a, a secondary, so the, the, the main crusher was out in the quarry. It was crushed up, breaking mostly down. And then the train would pull in, and the first building there where the train tracks come up to was the secondary crushing plant. They would take the stuff, they would grind it down, make it smaller. Then it went up into the processing plant, all those were. So they took the stone, and they basically ground it down into powder. And that is what would be shipped out into the steel mills. So, for it to be used as flux stone, the reason for flux stone is if you add powdered limestone into molten steel, it will help to float the impurities off of the molten steel. Then you have you pour that off the top and you have pure steel at the bottom. That is what flux stone is all about. So then and the production of flux stone of this quarry was very important during the war years. During the war years you could get a deferment from the draft if you stayed and worked at this quarry because the stone from this quarry was so important to the production of steel. This, 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 you know, I mean, this picture is just Amazing. So if you look at, when I first started, that building right there, that was, that, that's where quality control was housed. Forty years ago when I first started, that little building right there, I worked there for 13 years. And that, that's where we had our quality control office, that whole building. It was all part of, and, uh, by that and all that, 
rough, the big factory over that way had all gone away, and you had the galleys there. But just, I mean, this picture is just, to me, it's just amazing. This is one of the original cars, it's a, a steam shovel loading stuff, and you can see the people are right there uh, um, by the tracks. So they would pull down, they would move the tracks back over into the area where the stone was just blasted down. The steam shovel was loaded up into the shade cars, and that would be what would go to the uh, crusher. If you at the bottom, no special clothing, safety gear, stuff like this. So this is kind of the core then and now, let me jump to now. Uh, now is, that's not allowed anymore. <laughs> Everybody that works in the quarry is required by MSHA to go through an eight hour safety training course. You know, we do a little more than that. When we first start spring, we do the callback. We, we spend a week over in Sawmill Creek. Now, we go through working at heights to find space, uh, uh, cutting towards safety, conveyor belt safety, haulage safety, uh, environmental training, we have required by EPA to go through environmental training. We have HR training. We have to do all kinds of things. We spend an entire week over there. 